Hey everybody, welcome to week four of Advanced Java Programming. Is that right? There's only four? Gosh. Uh, seems like I've been doing this forever. I'm sure you're saying the same thing. Um, week four of Advanced Java Programming here at Portland State University. Um, uh, got, I think, an exciting class tonight. We're going to continue our experiment with um, test-driven development, writing code in real time. We're going to try some new things tonight. We're going to watch some videos. Um, and here again, this is an experiment. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, as we uh, explore new and exciting ways of, of learning Java. Um, so there are uh, four screencasts that comprise the two lectures, uh, two parts of the lecture um, that uh, I want you to watch uh, this week. Uh, the first two are about reflection and the, uh, the second two are all about uh, working with the web in Java, doing HTTP programming and things like that. Um, and uh, that's, the second two in particular will be um, necessary for your uh, client server um, program, which is part of Project 4. I want to get to that in a minute, but first, um, there were a couple questions on the community about uh, Project uh, either 2 or 3, I wasn't sure which. Um, before we dive into other things, uh, how are the projects going? Any questions there? Anything that you'd like clarified now that we're all here? Uh, 3, if you have the same exact uh, appointments, do you issue an error, or do you just...? Um, actually, I believe, believe behavior is undefined. That's probably why you're asking about it. Um, I don't... Should it be an error? I don't think it should be an error. Um, so, I mean, just sort of, yeah, you know, put it in there if it already exists. Okay, you know, no big deal. Um, I'm almost certain I don't test that case. So if you've implemented it to be an error, hey, good for you. It was not something that I was going to test. Yeah. Um, to make sure I'm doing this right for projects two and three. Um, so if you don't pass in a command line argument for text file, what we're supposed to do right, is just give it some kind of default name, but the difference would be that we don't um, add to it. Like we rewrite that default file. By it, do you mean the, fi the file? The file. So no, if you don't have dash text file, it should behave just like it did in the previous project, meaning nothing. So uh, that's, that's a, a good question. In that, if there's no text file, don't try to guess. So, right, I mean, this is sort of like the principle here is uh, don't try to be smarter than you, the user because you can't guess their intention. So, if they didn't tell you a text file, I, you know, I think the right thing to do is say, okay, yep, no text file. And so, yes, you have the, the same admittedly silly behavior that you did in the previous project, where like all you do is create, you know, the appointment and then you know print it out if there's oh. a dash print there. Okay. Yeah. Good. Thanks for asking that. And then, so if you do have that um, the text file. Um, and you have a print option, do you want to just print that one appointment or the entire appointment? Yep. Yeah, and that was the question that yeah, I think you posed on, yep. the, uh, on, the, on the community. Yes, so the dash print option does what it's always done. So the dash print doesn't change with project two. Uh, now you've got, uh, you know, you've got the text file option. So print will always just print the, the newly added um, appointment. Um, and then in project three, we add the pretty print which is for printing the entire appointment book. I think I saw someone ask about serialization. And yes. No. No on serialization. Um, as a matter of fact, I think that post was deleted before yeah, I, had, I, I could have replied. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I, I might have called it out. Yeah. The, the um, so uh, Java object serialization is uh, is, a, is an API is a, is a class. There's a class called object output stream. That is an output stream. You guys remember what an output stream is? Quick wins. Right. It writes bytes to some destination. Um, an object output stream is a filter output stream that takes an object, so any old object, it's got fields and things like that, and will write a description, uh, right, or turn that into a byte stream and write it out to some destination. And of course, there's an object input stream that will then read from that source of bytes and then turn it into an object. Um, and uh, for those of you who have watched the reflection uh, uh, slides, um, reflection is used to implement all of that, right? So the whole idea is that you go in there and you um, use the reflection API to uh, well get the values of all the fields, and then similarly when you're reading the the byte stream, you know there is a, a format there. There's a Java serialization standard that says here's the format of all the data, um, and then as it reads, it uses reflection to populate the object. Cool. Now, speaking of uh, questions, Thank you. Good question. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so, not 
particularly related to any project, general uh, programming stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you are, are um, like when I'm pricing the command line, so uh, if, if there's a readme printed, you know, then I want to print the readme and then anchor. Yes. So it's not an error or anything like that, so I, you know, I don't need to insert or an exception, it's just printing. So following that, would it be good form to put everything after that in an else block? Like, oh, yeah, that, that's... Um, that's a really good question, and this could be true of anything. You might have some method, and it's like, oh, if you know, uh, it's like performing division, but you wouldn't want to do that in method, right? If there's some sort of precondition that isn't met, but it's not an error, it's just like an exit quickly. Do you put the rest in an else block? Well, um, here's what I would say to that. Um, th there is a school of thought that would say, um. Use an else block, but all the code in that else block should be in a different method because you're doing something else. So if you, you know, the, the people that advocate having tiny methods, like there are some people that say, hey, listen, a method should be no more than like 10 lines. Some people even say five lines, but it's like just really, really, really short, a sit, very single purpose, right? Because obviously, I mean, there's this logic branch there. So, right, it's like, oh, okay, if, if this case, then do something. And that do something itself is a piece of logic. Some people say put that in its own method. So if you are, so let's say there's like so much logic there that would be in the else branch that it would deserve its own method, then I say go, go ahead and use an else branch and that reads like really nicely if this, then, you know, return otherwise, you know, um, call some method or, you know, return one value, return another value. Um, but if you're, if you're not going to sort of delegate all that behavior up to another method, um, I'd say it, it probably shouldn't go in an else block um, because your method shouldn't be that long, right? So method shouldn't be longer than a screen. So I think, you know, so whatever, you know, you, you want to have that, let's say it's, you know, 50 lines, and even there, I think your, your methods are getting kind of big. Um, so uh, I think, you know, so, so I think that the, the, the practice that is, is uh, more important is to have short methods and I think you'll find when you have you know shorter methods, um, it really won't make a difference if it's in an else block or if it's it'll be just as readable. I can say it that way. It'll be just as readable if it's in an else block or if it's outside an else block because you'll be able to see all, without scrolling. All right, there's a statement up top and then it goes and does some other stuff. Yeah, yeah. my, my yeah. method. So the, the parse method I have sort of right. I feel like at that limit, and I wasn't sure. And obviously, it doesn't matter one way or the other. But just the code will work the same. Um, if you think you're close to the limit, experiment. Right, you know, can you, you know, extract that else block or some part of that else block into a method? It's like, okay, well, can I then, you know, does this functionality right here, does this have a good name to it? And, you know, if so, then that can become its own method. Yeah, no problem. So what do they pay me for? I think they pay me. Well, they haven't paid me yet. Anyway. Um, oops, let me get this here. Uh, I want to ask you guys a couple of questions. Sort of do a review. We're a couple of weeks in. Let's, let's let's talk about some questions. Um, let's talk about. Well, let's just start at the beginning. It's a very good place to start. Uh, let me make that a little bigger. Just control plus it. Oh baby. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's just go around the room. Uh, anybody want to start? The first question: What tools use compile a Java program? Okay, oh, you're in the middle. Okay, Dan. Yep. Uh, Java C. Right, Java C is used to compile a Java program. Uh, and for bonus points, what does the dash D option do? For dash D, I have no idea. Anybody else? Destination. Destination, right? Is your destination? It's where the class files are written. Um, yeah. Uh, we'll go this way and then come back. So, what tool is used to run a Java program? Yes, and what does the dash class path option do? Again, yeah, easy one. Right. Yeah, I think it's really no more. Well, actually, dash class path, class path is the dot class files. So it's the compiled. Sure, the, right. the, the classes that are generated. Ah, right. Java yes. files. Yep. And what kinds of things can be on the class path? What kinds of files? Dot class files and dot jar files. Right, dot jars, and actually in directories. Directories and jar files can be right, because the directory is uh, is the same directory that you use with the dash D. 
can also be put on the class path. So right, it's not it's not path to the class file itself. It's really the base directory in which the you know like edu pdx would be the t that parent there. Describe the mechanism by which Java programs are platform independent, with air quotes for those of you watching at home. Nope. Try to forget your name. First question, what is your name? Oh, oh Parkson. Pa oh, yeah, Parkson. Yeah. Uh, because they use the JVM, the Java virtual machine, uh, on different operate, operating systems. So when you when you compile the Java file, you you can get different class files. Yep, exactly. So yeah, Java source code is compiled into bytecode, which is this platform independent um, uh, machine language. Um, and it's actually this virtual machine language. So there's a virtual machine that's implemented for every platform, but then your program um, is distributed as class files, and so that's how it runs on a platform. Good. What is an array? It's multiple. I know what it is. I just have a hard time explaining it. It's a whole set of data, all of the same type. Yep. And what kind? What types may be in arrays? Basically anything. Yep. Okay. Including arrays. Whoa. Um, actually, you know, you called it a set. Um, and that might be like a little s set, uh, but you know, an array is indexed, right? And so, like in Java, when you think of set, can we call it a collection? Uh, yeah, you could call it a collection. I think I, I would call it a an indexed collection, just to make it clear. Because, like in you know, when we talked about the the core APIs and the um, and the and the Java collections, right? A, a capital C collection in Java has no order, right? There's no con there's no guarantee about the order in which the elements are stored in. Um, where an array, they're you know they're indexed, so there is an order there. Yeah. It does, and and so what array list does? So there's collection, which is like this high level thing. There's a sub interface of that called list, and list is a collection, and then it adds more semantics onto that uh, collection by saying yes, the uh, so for a list, yes, the items are ordered. In their index order, essentially. Yeah. Yep. Good. So they are okay. stored um, sequentially always, like in, like a basic array is always going to be sequentially ordered, just like you would have in C or C Yes, okay. it would. Yeah. Um, yes. I'm just going to stop there. <laughs> uh, Java doc. So what's Java doc? Uh, thank you, Robert. Hi, Robert. <laughs> I did. Uh, Java doc is. A list of all the changes you've made to your Java application, and also as far as what your string methods are and classes. Sorry, changes to the. I'm thinking. I'm thinking the readme file on it. When you initialize things in your uh, IntelliJ, it always puts it to the Java doc. Oh right, yeah, it does have like some stuff over there in the banner, but like in general, what's what is Java doc? It's a general note of. Or it's a running tally of all the notes you put in your Java program as far as what each thing does. Exactly right. It's a special, um, well, in, in the source code, there's a special kind of comment. You guys remember the syntax for the comment? Slash, slash, star, slash, star, star. Slash, star, star, and then yep, star, slash. So a special comment syntax that uh, denotes that this is a documentation comment. It documents the thing that follows it. So what kind of things can be documented with JavaDoc? Anything. Class methods, data um, types, Not variables, but fields. So maybe it's what you meant. Yeah, members. Yeah, yeah. So members. So classes and it's members. And so for a uh, Java doc method, uh, so so for a method Java doc, what kinds of you can have these tags, right? What kind of things can be described in a uh, methods Java doc? Parameters. Right, parameters. Yep. Yep, the, the, what it returns. Yep, what it throws. Its name. Yeah, you can have like at author, you can have like at C. What else would be interesting? Well, that's probably about it. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Um, 
So I just noticed that there's, maybe I'm getting this confused, but that there's, I think I'm confusing this with class, but like on other Java docs, it seems like there's like general documentation for packages or something. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Like where was that? Oh, very good question. Right. So if you look at the API documentation, you see that there's these nice descriptions of packages. It's like, well, where the hell does that go? So how does that work again? You can have, yes, okay, I think the way it works, and oh, I know, I could use the internet. Um, I'm pretty sure what you have is a special file called like package or something. So uh, javadocs for a package. Uh, ah, yes, okay, so... The old way was that you'd have a package.html file that would then describe it. Um, the newer way um, is you have a special class called, it's not even class, it's a special Java file called package-info.java. And if you, um, then there's some syntax, uh, well, let's see here. Um, Forget the okay. So you just right. You have a package info dot, dot Java, and then you have uh, basically a declaration of your package. Like uh, yeah, declaration of the package, um, and then you can have a comment for that. So this is like the newfangled way to do it. Um, and uh, I think the, the 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 biggest advantage here is that you can put annotations. This is how you put annotations on your package. Meaning an HTML file will only be interpreted by the javadoc utility. Um, and even then, if you're not using a doclet, anyway. Um, whereas a .java file, the compiler can read. So the compiler will read this, and you can put in um, uh, annotations. Remember what annotations are? It's like the at test in JUnit. It's just like these little, they're not exact, they're not javadoc, um, uh, I forget what those are called now. Java.tags. Um, uh, they, they are a, lang a, a language thing. They're outside of a um, their language feature. They're outside of a comment, and uh, they um, and, and you can have you know, like if you want to deprecate an entire package, you can put like at deprecated um, on a package, and you declare it in this package info.java file. Anyway, so I hope that answers your question. Okay. Yeah. Whoa. Let's see here. Who has an answer to the question? No one no, no, with you. Um, how do you print text to the console in a Java program? Uh, you used, uh, like a system out. Yep, system.out.println. And can you tell me what those three words mean, system and out and print line? What are those things? Um, so, great. System dot out to print line. Is it magic? What, what, when I say capital S system, what does that refer to? System, no printing system. Um, not exactly. Class. Right. There's a class called capital S system oh. that uh, sort of represents the system. Okay. So then, what's out? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Grover. <laughs> Nope, it's not a subclass. It's a static, yep, it's a static field of out. So, right, capital S system, class, dot, out. Out is a static field of system um, that refers to an object. It's a, it's a type print stream. And so then what does print line do? What does print line mean? It's a method. Yep, it's a method <laughs> on that object. Right, so system dot out to print line. It's not magic. There's a static class called capital S system. There's a static field in that class called out of type print stream that has a method called print line. So, you know, this isn't like Pascal or whatever where, um, where uh, you know, printing, you guys have never used Pascal, have you? Uh, or Fortran. Well, anyway, back in the old days, things like, you know, writing out to uh, standard out was sort of like this um, intrinsic thing in the language. Um, it's, no, there's no magic in it in Java. Um, What is a package and what are they good for? Oh, I should know. Thanks, guy. Uh, keeps, keeps everything related to, I guess, your 
project in similar areas so that it's quicker for it to access and it's more stable? Yeah. So what is that everything that gets grouped together? What kinds of things get grouped together in a package? It's all your related classes. Yeah, classes. What other kinds of things can go in, in packages? Um, X, yeah, I was thinking interfaces. It's true that you can have like like your package HTML and you have other things. Um, I, I don't know if they're. I really know. If, I don't know if I would say if they're in the package as much as they are in the same directory structure. Um, but yeah, good point. I, I was thinking interfaces. I guess also exceptions, but those are just classes. Okay, good. Um, Who's next? I'll go with you next. Um, name uh, some ways that the Java programming language differs from C++. Yes. Um, What kind of programming? Sorry, what? Procedural programming. Right? Oh, procedural. Program without the class. But I think in Java, you cannot do that. Um, that's true, that all code must be in a class in Java. Um, I think, strictly speaking, I, I, I think one can make an argument that you can do procedural programming in Java with like static methods and things like that. But, but it's not without class. But you're right. There must be a class there someplace. Yeah, that's true. And then C directly creates an executable. I mean, there's no bytecode. Right, there's no virtual machine. It's all compiled down in native code. Yeah. What about a couple of some other different language differences? Garbage right? Garbage yep. Garbage uh, garbage Java has automatic memory management, garbage collection. Good. Exceptions? Uh, right, exceptions in Java are sort of a first class citizen. Exceptions in C are, well, maybe it's better now than it was like 15 years ago, but still the second class citizen. What did you say, Dan? Uh, no operator overloading. Right, no operator overloading. Um, well, there's one operator that's overloaded. What's that? Plus, right. Um, but you're right. The user cannot, or you know, a programmer cannot overload other operators. What's Good. the difference about exceptions then? So, and correct me if I'm wrong. I haven't used C plus plus in, in quite a while. But my understanding is that th there are exceptions. There's exception mechanism in the language in C plus plus, um, and well, certainly. Modern runtimes implement it, but um, exceptions got a, a really bad rap in C++. And so, m my understanding, I think it's still true, that C++ programs don't really leverage exceptions. Does that jive with what you guys have experienced? They use exception methods. They do or do not? Yeah. They just came to the game really, really late, so they, you know, Java was pretty much the new language by the time they started to be used, but mm -hmm. they're used quite heavily. Um, in C++, you have to do some real backflips to catch all of the exceptions, like you have to write some operating system level functions. Oh, wow, really? Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah. Screwy. Okay. Exactly. I don't think you have to use exceptions in C++. Right. Do you remember what those kinds of exceptions are called? Checked exceptions. Right, checked exceptions. Yeah. Um, that's my understanding too. It would be having to declare exceptions. Like you have to declare what a, what a method will throw if it doesn't catch the exception itself. Mm -hmm. And like C++ doesn't have a version of throws. Okay. So it's, yeah, it's probably more like everything's a runtime exception. Yeah. Who's next? Um, uh, wait, wait, eight primitive types. What are Java's eight primitive types? Uh, there's the int types, int. which are long, short, int, uh, double and float, character, uh, boolean, and byte. Yeah. yeah. You said short. That way. Byte, short, int, long, double, float, care, boolean. Yes, there you go. Nice. Good deal. 
Uh, well, we already talked about what operators use can get strings. We already talked about exceptions. Uh, you've already answered a lot of questions. Actually, so we'll just open it up here. Um, how do you convert a string to an int? Yes, person on what class? Well, say it loud and proud. What is it? So, no. <laughs> capital I integer, right? So it's capital I integer dot parse it. Um, how do you convert an int to a string? Well, I. Integer dot two string. String dots. Oh wait, it's a string constructor. Um, I don't think there's a string constructor that takes an int. You guys, you guys are close. So I think if you went to if you know, if you went and then you know, did a quick Google search, we're looking at the Java docs. You're looking in the right places. So uh, I can think of a couple of ways. I think someone said, "Oh, capital I integer dot two string." That's true. You could create a capital I integer and call its two string method, and that would do it. Um, good, bad. What do you think about that? Do that, then you're incurring the um, construction of an object before calling to string. And I think it may have been string. There's some static function out there that lets you do it directly without. The yes. Uh, value of. Yes. String dot value of. Yep. Hey, excellent stack overflow, which is just amazing, right? I mean, I wish I had that when I was. Well, I do have it now in my program, but boy, I would I would have drunk more beer and. College, if I anyway, um, yes. So string dot value of um, is a method is a static method that is overloaded to take pretty much everything um, they could possibly imagine and turn them all into strings. Good. Um, and then last question: uh, What does the jar tool do? Jar. 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 Yeah, it creates jar files. Is a zipping mechanism which will create all the necessary components of a project together. And it will also list the main class with the main method so that the program of the Java can go in there and execute that class, find that class, find that method to execute and go. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Very good. So, yes. So, jar is a utility that, um, well, just really gloms a bunch of files together into another file. It may zip it, uh, optionally, or not. Um, and then you can also have... A, uh, you can also have uh, there's a thing called a manifest in there that describes the contents of the jar file, and inside your manifest, you can specify what class you want to be the main class that makes an executable jar file, um, and then uh, you can hand that executable jar file to the um, JVM, and it'll automatically start running that class as the main. Yeah. Optionally, is it not? Mm -hmm. Can it be zip? That, I well, I, I would say compression is optional. Uh, so I don't know exactly what I mean by zip, but when I think zip, when I hear zip, I think compression. Yes. So I'm, uh, and maybe this isn't the case anymore, where there's always compression. Um, I can't think now. No, maybe there always is compression. Uh, it, well, there is an option to, um, to uh, jar whether or not you want to zip it or not. So, so I, I interpret that as meaning, well, there's either compression or no compression or compression and less compression. I don't know. But yeah. Maybe this is by default unless until you specify not to. Probably, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's, you know, I think there was a time where it was like, oh, gosh, compression, that'll make it slow. But, you know, compression is really fast these days. Okay. Cool. Any other questions for you, from you, before uh, we, we dig in? Okay. Um, okay. Let's uh, let's take a quick walk through project four. Okay, client server. Okay, um, it's all nice and readable. Okay. So we are going to. Uh, well, implement the next phase of our appointment book um, application in Project 4, uh, which is to create a RESTful appointment book web service. So uh, in the web screencast, we talk about how to work with web applications in Java and um, how to, uh, well, uh, and what representational tra state transfer, REST, is all about. And then you'll have a chance to work with uh, these concepts in your Project 4. So, uh, 
In project four, uh, you're going to implement uh, an appointment book servlet. So um, I always put this stuff up last night. Has anybody had a chance to um, watch the, uh, the, the? Okay, that's fine. Uh, and I'm sorry, I'm I'm getting behind. I was hoping to have uh, all this stuff uh, ready sooner, but um, well, life just hasn't allowed it. So um, in Java web applications, there are uh, these things called servlets, which basically handle URLs. And so it's a Java object that gets called by your web container when you hit a URL. And I'd like you to implement a, a servlet called appointment book servlet, which provides uh, a, a REST API um, to your appointment book. So uh, basically, in this assignment, you'll be implementing URLs uh, like, okay, when I hit you know appointment book slash appointments uh, owner equals name, if I hit it with a get request, it'll return all the appointments in the appointment book using your pretty printer. If I hit it with a post, it'll create a new appointment um, but, uh, from the HTTP request parameters like owner description, begin time, and end time. Um, and also, if I do a post and an appointment book hasn't been created yet, it'll uh, create a new one. Um, I also, uh, and I think this is, yeah, this is new functionality. Um, if I hit a URL uh, with a larger query string, uh, like owner equals name, and then begin time equals whatever, and end time equals whatever. Um, hitting that with a get should return all of the appointment books appointments that occurred between the start time and the end time. So this is new functionality to your um, to your appointment book. It's got to be able to return all of the appointments. Um, actually, by return, I mean pretty print um, uh, all the appointments in a given uh, time range. Yeah. Sorry, what? What happens if you hit that with a post? Um, 403, whatever the, um, what, what, what happens? Um, Not make a new request. Not make a new one, right. And uh, so, so you shouldn't, yeah, so uh, it, it should do whatever the default behavior is, which I think is return whatever HTTP status code says not supported or 404 or something like that. Um, it's all there in the um, yeah boy I wish I got this it's all there on the screencast um, well, let's take a look at some of the code and maybe it'll be a little more maybe it'll be a little more clear um, I kind of don't want to have to um, rerun the, uh, the the slides for you guys but um, Hopefully, I can give you enough of an idea so that when you you know watch the watch the screencast, it'll make sense. So, you're going to have the servlet that gets deployed in a web container. So the whole idea is that you've got this JVM which uh, handles web requ web requests, and you have installed into it this appointment book servlet that'll handle those web requests. So that's the server side. Now you also need a client, and so your client you could hit these with a web browser. These URLs with a web browser, um, but I want you to write a Java client that sends HTTP requests like a web browser would. But you're going to have a Java program that sends HTTP requests off to the server, um, and this is a little command line utility. So uh, really, the, the command line is about the same as as it used to be, except there's no more text file, no more pretty print, because instead of uh, storing the appointment book, well. Locally, you're storing it on your server, and that's a different process, right? So now uh, we have we have two Java programs running. One of which is the web container that's running your uh, well, the web container, the web server that's running your servlet, and the other one is your command line that starts up uh, and communicates with the web server and then shuts down. But all of the appointment book data is stored on the um, on the server. What your client does is it will send requests and then you know print out the, the responses. Um, so let's see here, you know, you have your owner description, begin time, and end time, just like you have in the past. Now you've got some different options. You've got dash host and dash port, which specify the host name and port on which the server runs. Um, you have uh, search, which will uh, basically hit this URL. It does the query between, two, uh, between the begin time and the end time. Uh, you got print, which is the same as always has been, and readme, which should be updated for project four. So here are oops, here are some examples. 
scrolling gone wild. Here are some examples of some command lines uh, that you can use. You'd run your project for. So, oh, your server's already running, and you can hit with a command line like, okay, here's my host, csfpdx.edu, here's my port, and then I've got my owner um, appointment, and then start time and end time. So that would create a new appointment. So that would end up calling a post to this URL. If you want to search for appointments between uh, a given time, the command line will look like this. Uh, and so, so really the only arguments that are there um, are the, uh, yeah, are, are, sorry, are the owner and then the begin time and end time. The description is, uh, is, not, is no longer required there. Actually, it shouldn't even be there. So, uh, you know, if uh, error, hand, uh, error scenarios like syntax command lines wrong, formats wrong, or if you can't connect to the server, exit gracefully. So no stack trace, no big you know, blow up or anything like that. Um, you'll handle these cases and other similar ones um, effectively. So to get started, um, I have a Maven archetype. And so here's, uh, let's create uh, a new project. Um, I'll use this one. Let's see here. This is not a good place for me to be, though. Um, I call that. Okay, so I'll run the Maven archetype. That's going to be completely bogus. Let's see here. First guy, fix the tilde, as always. And got put in my login ID. And let's see, the artifact ID is appointment book. Version is summer 2003. Uh, yep, this is all good. Okay. Let's go to appointment book. Let's uh, make an IntelliJ project. Let's open up the IntelliJ project. Slowly, yes. This application is from the internet. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't know why it's asking me about this. There it is. Ah. Stop. Okay. Um. Sure. Probably not actually going to add this to version control. Okay. So, what have I got? I don't really care about that subversion error. Okay, let's look at the files that were created. Uh, that's not interesting. Delete that. Okay. Um, palm, I'm not going to go into the palm right now. Okay, we've got uh, several things. So this is what the archetype uh, create uh, gives you. It gives you a servlet, uh, something called the REST client. Um, I don't remember what messages are, and then project four, which is your is your main. Um, well, we need to bring in the classes. Exactly right. So um, you'll need to copy in your classes from project three into project four because you're going to you're going to need your appointment, your appointment book, your pretty printer. You're not going to need, well, actually, will you need your, no, you won't need your text parsers. Well, you, you could use your text parser, I suppose, but you don't have to. Um, actually, let me double check that. Do I specify, um, okay, so yeah, definitely the pretty printer, but I don't specify, for instance, well, I, yeah, in here, this is pretty printer, too. Yeah, so both of those are pretty print. Right, so you'll need to copy some stuff in here. But what this does give you uh, is the following. Okay, so um, what the archetype creates is a, um, a little dummy application that instead of um, posting key value pairs back to the server, sorry, instead of posting appointments back to the server, it simply posts key value pairs. And so this is sort of get, get you started to show how you can um, how you can uh, well make these HTTP calls. 
And so honestly, part of this project is a little bit of debugging and to figure out, okay, well, how do, uh, how does all this HTTP stuff work? So actually, I'm going to need two windows here. Let me create another one that's big. Because, by the way, hey, you're doing distributed programming because you've got two Java processes running all at once. And here you thought this was just a Java course. See the value they get here at Portland State University? Ding. Anyway. You get to work in two windows now, not just one. Two terminals. Um, okay. So let me get in the same directory. Portland State Java, 2003 appointment book. Okay, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, package everything up. So this will go, this will uh, compile my source code, run the unit tests, uh, everything else. Oh, um, eh, I'll get to that in a second. Okay, so here I'm going to start my uh, web application by uh, running Jetty, which is a, uh, well, which is the web container that we use. So what it does is it starts up uh, Jetty and deploys very quickly um, deploys my my web application. So now if I go to my browser, Jetty. no, Maven takes care of all of it. So there's a, there's a Jetty plugin that goes and downloads not only the plugin but also Jetty itself. Poof, takes care of all of it for you. So yes, you don't need to install anything special to use the Jetty web container. Now if I go to localhost, um, port 8080, um, it tells me, okay, so now when I hit uh, port 8080 on localhost, it hits the web browser, eh, sorry, it hits the web container and um, tells me I got a 404. And it's nice to say, oh, but uh, there are contexts, there are applications deployed on this server, like appointment book. So if I hit appointment book, oops. Doesn't look good. Am I supposed to get better URL there? Appointments. Oops. There we go. Okay. So I hit a, a, a URL like appointment book slash appointments, and this is the the dummy implementation that just implements key, that just has key value pairs. And so it returns a little text string saying, oh, okay, you've got zero key value pairs. So that's my server running. So I'll go back here. And now I want to run my, uh, I want to run my main program, which is project four. And so uh, here again, the command line, uh, you'll have to rewrite the command line parsing to parse it the way you, know, you want for the project. But here, um, I can uh, I can put in key value pairs. So, uh, or I can create key value pairs. So I add in localhost 8080 is the port key. And if I let's see if I have nothing, it tells me that I contain zero key value pairs. So what this Java program just did is it made a call out to the um, out to the the web out to the web container out to the web server. The same thing as this web page did. So it basically hit this URL in Java instead of hitting it there in your browser. Now, if I want to add something, um, I can say a key like um, uh, the key is one, the value is going to be the number one. So it mapped one to one. And now if I go and reload over here, it says it contains one key value pair. Um, if I, let's see here, if I just do one with nothing, It'll tell me that it uh, it searches for one, so I can have two go to two, and now if I want to print all of them, I go like that. Okay, so this is like a little example program to get you started. What I recommend is that you spend some time in the debugger figuring it out. So let, let me let me uh, let me take a couple minutes and. Uh, show you how to use the debugger. On this um, on this project, so um, this is going to be in for IntelliJ. If you guys are using a different IDE, then uh, well, you're on your own. Um, I'm going to add a new remote uh, configuration. So what I'm doing in IntelliJ is oh, and actually I'm not debugging Jetty. So okay, I need to restart Jetty. 
Uh, you guys use the debugger much in Java? A little bit? Okay, some people yes, some people no. Okay, well, uh, first off, what you need to do is you need to configure the JVM to say, hey, run yourself in a mode such that a debugger can attach to you. So here, Jetty is being run in one process. IntelliJ is a different process, and we want IntelliJ to connect remotely to that, uh, to that VM, to the web container VM, and then it'll debug it remotely. So it's not like when we were debugging our unit tests in that IntelliJ was running the unit tests. When it went and launched the, the JVM for the unit test, it would, it would automatically put the right stuff, the right command line configuration on the VM so that it could connect to it. Because we're running um, Jetty using Maven, um, we need to uh, enable the, the debuggability of the VM explicitly. Um, and the way you do that, and, and luckily IntelliJ, um, so I'm going to call this like remote Jetty server. Um, IntelliJ makes it pretty easy to configure it. It tells you, hey, this is the command line that you should put on the remote VM since I want to run on localhost and port um, 5005. So I'm going to copy that. I'm going to go, I'm going to control C my Jetty server right there. And I'm going to say, I think I need to set maven ops equals, well, that's all one, the long command. And now I think when I start Jetty, yep, it says that it's listening, I went by pretty quickly, it's listening for a socket to connect to it on port 5005 for debugging, so it's up and running. I'm sorry, so you set the environment variable maven ops, yeah. Jetty which Maven knows to look at. So when it goes to launch Java, a Jetty, which is a Java program itself, it, uh, it should, yeah, yes. Is that listed anywhere? Sorry, what? Is that listed, like what the export change we need to? Um, uh, it's all over Google. So, uh, you know, so let's see here. Debug Maven Jetty. Well, whatever, it's, it's the same thing. The client is different, you know. Is yeah, but this is like what you need to set. So let's see here. Oh yeah, and yeah, Maven off. This is like the Windows way of doing it, but it's just a matter of yeah, setting that environment variable. However, you set that in your environment. Thanks. Yep. Setting environment variables is a familiar concept to you guys. Yes. Okay. Good. Okay. So now I can attach to that VM. And it's saying, great, you're attached, but we don't have any breakpoints yet. So what I'll do is I'll go over here into my project one, and I'll set a breakpoint right here. Sure. Um, and now when I go to run my command line argument, oops. Oh, didn't, oh duh, OK. Haha. <laughs> Debugging multiple processes. I set a breakpoint in, um, in the main method, which isn't the process that I'm debugging. I'm debugging the server. Main is not, this main is never invoked by the server. Instead, I want to hit something on my servlet. So here is a, um, I have two methods. Um, I'll make it a little bigger. So my servlet Servlet uh, extends HTTP servlet, which is a standard oops, is a standard Java class. So it comes from the API servlet API jar, um, and it overrides methods like do get and do post. So what a web container does for you is a web container is a web server that knows how to route HTTP requests to servlets. So when I hit in the web browser, if I go and hit the um, just this uh, this URL right here. So I hit reload here in my web browser. That immediately hit this breakpoint in IntelliJ because now I'm doing a, a get. Well, what do I do? Okay, I set the content type to text plain. I will see here. I'll go to my next one. I'll get the parameter key. Key in this case is null. So um, it will go to write all mappings. And so I'll step into that. And so now basically what it does is it says, hey, the HTTP servlet response. So the servlet API also provides abstractions, uh, objects that let you get information about the request that came in and the response that was being returned. And you can get me a print writer, which will write the content of it. And then it prints out things like, hey, here's how many um, 
uh, items there are in it, and then it'll iterate over each one of those guys and, and format a key value pair. So, um, well, I don't really know what to uh, debug or you know what to walk through here, but I suggest that you I, I suggest that you uh, leverage the debugger because um, I think starting in this project things get more complex, right? You're dealing with multiple Java programs that are running at the same time, um, and uh, it's hard to keep everything in your head. And I suppose you could just add a whole bunch of print lines and start to figure out what's going on. But from what I've heard my students in the past, that those that leverage the debugger were able to get things done a lot faster because um, you know they could set breakpoints and get a much better idea of all the thing, all of the moving parts. So you know this is the advanced part of advanced Java. So it's not only that the concepts getting more advanced, but the projects are getting more difficult because there are more pieces part. There are more things moving at the same time. Um, but then again, this is just the way web programming works, right? So we've gone from one, you know, program that sort of started at main, did its thing, and it was all pretty straightforward to reason about, to, okay, you've got this Java program that's in there running, handling requests whenever they come in. Um, and this is going to be a theme that we see, that we're going to revisit again, and actually even more so, in the final project, which is the GWT project. So invest the time in, um, in learning to use the debugger. Um, the, the the point I'm making is that uh, up until now, I'm guessing that uh, the kinds of programs that you're writing have been have felt familiar to you because I, I, my guess and based on my experience with the department over the years is that you know, for up, up until now, the kinds of programs that you've written are just sort of you know, start at main and go, maybe you're creating objects and things like that. Well, now you're dealing with, uh, you're dealing with two processes that are communicating over HTTP and there are a lot more moving parts um, and so things to debug. Such as, okay, so uh, we're still attached to this debugger. Let's also Let's go to the, the project for main, and let's run this guy. Let's debug this guy, project four. Oops. Sure. Project four edit configurations. Let's put the program arguments like localhost 8080. Oh, and let's just put 3.3 three on there. So now I want a breakpoint here. I'm going to run project 4 from the debugger. So instead of attaching to a process that's running, so I, so I started my Maven uh, jetty up here, and I ran it in debuggable mode, and I attached my debugger in IntelliJ to that. Now I'm going to run the main for project 4 in IntelliJ. So instead of running it from the console, which I suppose I, I, I could do and debug it remotely from there, I'm just going to run it directly from IntelliJ. So I'm going to debug that. So okay, so now I've hit a breakpoint in my main. And this is where I parse the command line arguments. So I'm hitting F8 just to go to the next one and it's okay, found, it's found the host and the port, it's found a key, it's found the value. So everything's all happy. Okay, I'm going to parse the blah, 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 blah. Okay, now, so we'll do the server side. The server side is the servlet with the get, do the do get, and the do post, both pretty simple. Now we're going to the client side. On the client side, we need to make the requests to the server. Um, and so as you'll see in the screencasts, there's, uh, oh, there's a whole bunch of APIs that sort of come standard for doing this kind of thing. I've written um, for what I hope is your convenience, a, uh, a, a class called Appointment Book REST Client that abstracts uh, a bunch of the, uh, of the communication, um, a, a bunch of mechanisms for making the HTTP calls um, uh, out for you. So it puts it in a different place. And so, well, we'll take a look at what this does in a second. Okay, so what it's doing is it's, it's saying, well, based on the parameters that came in, like, hey, is there a key? Hey, is there a value? Do something different with the client. So key is not null, 
value is not null. Okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to add one of these key value pairs. So I'm going to step into that one, which is clicking on this or F7. Okay, and so the add key value pair method calls post with the URL that's associated with this client, and then the parameters are key, the parameter key, string value, and then the parameter value. I'll step into that. Okay, and so this is a class called HTTP Request Helper, which is something that I wrote and I talk about in the um, in the screencast. And uh, this is really what does the heavy lifting of putting together the URL, URL requests. And I won't go into details about this because you do see it in the in the screencast. But this is some code I suggest that you understand what it does, um, but you won't have to modify it. It should do everything that you need. So this is code that will do the post for you. Anyway, so this will go off and do the post, create a URL connection. These are all standard Java classes. It'll write uh, the, um, the the body with the key value pair. So you see data right here is just the key value pair. That's a very useful key value pair. Um, it'll write it off to the uh, request. It'll flush it, which will then send it to the server. It's waiting for a response. Oops. And oh, here it is. So wait a second. Oh, we didn't continue there. Um, and now the debugger stops at the, on the server side at this debug point in deep in do post. And so now we can step through it here. This is where it starts getting debugging starts getting interesting because I got two debugging sessions open because I got two uh, programs, two Java programs running at the same time. Anyway, um, so while the assignment is about learning about the web, what I really want you to get out of this, what I think you'll learn and be able to take with you other places, is working with distributed software, working with a client server. And I think in terms of programming, you'll see that you need to approach the problem a little differently and, and, and approach the, the way that you work with your program a little differently. Okay. Um, Oh yeah, that was me, and now it returned. Anyway, um, we can look at the output, map to three. Okay, questions about that? I know it was a lot, so it should be on the screencast, so you can go back and watch it again. Um, you know, please feel free to ask questions. This is something new, and I'm guessing something that you haven't seen before, um, and uh, there might be a lot of new things to deal with, um, but that's part of what makes it fun. Yeah. The, the Jetty server, is it, it's written in Java, and we've basically loaded that as a module into the JVM, so it's a process that's executing. Yep. And then Project 4 is a second one. Yes. Okay, and, but we're looking at both of them from one instance of intelligence. Yeah, and that's where it gets kind of wacky, right? Um, as a matter of fact, I think it's, uh, it's possible. I mean, the Maven, the Maven project. Uh, there are no premium parts to display. Oh, what was that? Sorry. What is the JD server? Maybe I'm not. Okay, so um, oh, why did I click John yes? Uh, well, yeah, and and here again, this would probably make a whole heck of a lot more sense if um, oops. Do I have other. Oh, here it is. Um, let me. There's a picture in here that I think that will help. Okay, or maybe I'll just confuse you some more. I've got. Oh, that's pretty wacky. Okay. Uh, the web, server, and client. You get that much, right? Okay, you're all familiar with that. And you use a URL to fetch some content from a server and then display it in some client. You're probably most familiar with using a web browser as the client and asking for HTML, but there's nothing in the HTTP protocol that says it has to be HTML. Um, so what you're working with this assignment is that you're not sending HTML back from the server, you're sending text, you're sending your pretty printed um, uh, appointment book. Okay. And so the picture that at least I have in my head, and I think it works pretty well, is that you've got some client, and okay, this is, this 
picture shows a web browser, but in your assignment is going to be a Java program over here on the client. And then remotely, it could be running on the same machine, but it's a different process no matter what. A different, either on a different, oh, on the server machine, there's a JVM that runs Jetty, which is your web container. Um, and so this is, this is a Java program that, well, what it does is it will handle HTTP requests that come in on a configured port. And what it does with those requests is it routes it to first web applications, um, which is a uh, um, is, is a whole bunch of servlets and other things that are bundled all together into this web application. And then the web application is responsible for um, routing particular URLs off to servlets. And so then uh, you can have multiple web applications inside your web container, and you can have multiple servlets inside your web application. Does that help? I yeah. I don't want to make you go over the stuff because it's in the, the lecture. Can you explain exactly? I, I get that. But what is a, a servlet? Is that a Java specific thing? I've never. Heard yes, of it's a Java specific thing. So it's a little server, right? So okay. the whole idea is that it's an object. It, it's, it's nothing fancy. It's a Java object that handles HTTP requests, oh, and and the job of the container is to take this HTTP request and deliver it to your servlet in a uh, in a way it can work with. So let's go back to the source code, and uh, no, I don't want to reload the project. If we go and look at the servlet, uh, make you big, make you big. Um. So it extends HTTP servlet and overrides a method called do get, which is called when there is a get request that comes in. Get and post are different flavors of HTML requests. So there's a thing called the HTML, sorry, the HTTP. HTTP method is basically different verbs you can do on a URL. Give me that URL. Post something to that URL. Delete what's ever at that URL. Um, Etc. And those get translated into um, these do get or do post methods. And what the um, and and th these methods are invoked by the container itself. So your web request comes in, your container lights up and says, "Okay, well, look at that URL. Oh, that's to the you know uh, let's go look at the URL. That's to the appointment book serve. Uh, that's, the, that's the appointment book web application. Okay." That's the web application created here by this project. And then the appointment book application is going to look and say, oh, that's the appointments um, URL. Well, that gets routed off to the appointment book servlet. And actually, all of this is uh, configured in a file called WebXML. So in WebXML, we define a servlet called appointment book servlet. And then we map that servlet to a URL slash appointments slash appointments goes to appointment book servlet. So there's a little bit of glue, it was all explained, um, and you can tell me how well I explain it, um, probably not very well, um, in, the, uh, in, in the slides, in the uh, screencast. Um, so what did the web content have and how did it relate to the server? The servlet is, is inside a web application which runs inside a web, web container. It's all is yes. It's all Java programs. It's all stuff that's written in Java. So yep. The web container is an object. Is a Java program, I'd say, and it's probably better. So yes, there are objects there, and I'm sure there's some way of starting up the web container, and I'll go off and create a bunch of objects, things for handling the URLs and parsing the URLs and routing stuff all over the place. Um, so but it's a, it's a Java program. So specific or special about web container that we give it a new term and rather not. Generic term program. Um, because it, 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 in particular, web containers, there is a there is a standard out there called the servlet standard, and the uh, and all Java web containers implement that standard. They basically say, okay, great, if you you know give me a web application, I will route these URLs to it, essentially, and it will. And so there are you know several implementations, uh, different implementations of web containers out there. So it was a port. Port 8080 and somebody in one of the notebooks that usually port 80. So what's specific about? It's what it is sort of the by convention. It's the port that uh, is the default port that Java web containers run on. Can are there more than 80? It, it's totally configurable. 
right? If if you uh, the default, so so the standard port for HTTP is port eighty, but on on well, at least Unix operating systems and me was true on Windows these days. Um, port eighty is restricted. Only you know special users can run on run programs. Okay, sorry. Only special users can run programs that listen on port eighty. So. To make it easier for for developers who might not be running as root or don't want to run as root on their machine, um, the the uh, the web container usually hosts up serves up content on port eighty eighty. It's configurable. Eighty eighty is the same as eight zero eighty. Yes, eight zero eight zero eighty eighty. Yes, so eighty eighty is the same as port eighty. No, they're different ports. It's just that it's the, it's serving up content, so it's like it's listening for requests on port eighty eighty. Another program might be run, listening on port eighty, but that's a different program. Clear as mud. Yay! Okay. So it seems like a container can have more than one sublet. Yep. And actually, yes, container can have more than one web application, and each web application can have more than one servlet. And I suppose there's only one web container running at the, any given point of time. Yeah, running on a, on a given port. So 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 yes, I, I I I it may be technically possible to have multiple web containers running inside the same JVM, but you wouldn't want to do that. Instead, it's sort of a, a one to one. It's like oh, okay, web container is sort of like the top level program that's got a main. It starts up everything like that. It sits there and listens on a port, and when requests come in on that port, it you know attempts to handle that request by uh, you know finding a web application and a server within that web application to route it to. And uh, servlet, can we say that servlet is quite parallel to each application that we have? For um, example, in this case, we have mm -hmm. this phone book appointment book, whatever. Yeah. And then another application is there, which is totally irrelevant to this one. So will there be a servlet for each of them? I would say there would be a web application for each one of these. So here in this example, what I'm trying to convey is that, OK, maybe I've got you know some website which is being hosted by this web container. And so this can have things like, oh, here's a server that tells that, that lets the user you know interact with the store, buy books or you know or whatever. Um, maybe I've got a servlet that uh, serves up content that describes here's what the bookstore is all about. Right? Here's where it's located. That would be the about servlet. So two different servlets that would handle two different URLs. Maybe a contrived example. Mm -hmm. There's also another web application called internal, and maybe this is what an employee of the store goes to use to like update the inventory or handle payroll or hire new employees or whatever. So different web applications deployed in the same web container, so running in the same process, and these two are completely separate. They don't know about each other. So there are more than one sublet in each application. Potentially, yes. All good questions. <laughs> Well, let me know. So, so please go home, spend some time with the screencasts, and uh, let me know what, what questions you have. Um, this is the part of the you know, course where we experiment with the screencasts and see if they're effective or not. So you're not using the screencasts earlier? No. Guinea pigs. OK. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, a little bit off this subject, but like, so how does Tomcat like, fit into this? So Tomcat is another web container. Okay. Yep. So yeah, Tomcat and Jetty are probably the number one and two web containers, Java web containers. There are other ones, but I don't think they're as popular. And we will be using Jetty here, not that Tomcat. Yep, there is a Tomcat Maven plugin, and you, can, you, you could use it, but Jetty works just as well. And I've tested it so I know it works. Okay, awesome. Time for a break. Um, so let's see here. It's 7.15. Let's take 15 minutes, and uh, we'll come back at 7.30 and do some other stuff. Thanks.